Hi friends, welcome to another lesson in the NAT Operations and Concepts module. In this lesson we'll be discussing static PAT. So if we pull up our definitions from the NAT terminology lesson, we know that a static translation is one where the administrator explicitly defines the pre-translation and post-translation mappings, and a PAT is a modification of IP addresses and ports. Which means if we combine those together, we end up with a definition of a static PAT as an explicit mapping between one IP address and port to another IP address and port. The overall goal of a static PAT is to make an internal resources ports externally accessible. This is different from a static NAT in which we made an internal resource externally accessible by IP address. Here we're doing it by port. So let me show you how that works. Here's the topology we'll be using. We've got a couple of hosts on the outside and then two internal hosts. Now, since we're doing a PAT, we're not necessarily concerned with just these hosts IP addresses. We're concerned with these hosts IP addresses and the ports from which they are hosting a particular service. So this server is hosting some service on IP address 104441, port 8080. And then this server is hosting some service on IP address 104442, port 443. For these hosts on the outside to access these services, again, we can't have them send something to the private IP addresses directly because then their packets will be dropped on the internet. We have to use a correlating public IP address. So this is what a static PAT configuration would look like. We would be telling our router that the IP address and port 104441, port 8080, should always be translated to and from the public IP address 738244, port 80, and the private IP 104442 and port 443 should always be translated to the public IP 738244, port 443. So let me show you what that would look like with packets. So let's say our first host, externally over here, shoots a packet to the destination IP address 738244 and destination port 80. When this packet hits our router, it'll be matched against this static PAT configuration, and the destination 738244 port 80 will get remapped to the IP address 104441 port 8080, just according to our configuration in the static PAT. The other host might shoot a packet to 738244 port 443, and you'll notice that'll map this configuration, and it'll therefore be translated to 104442 port 443. Now, some of you might notice, hey, wait a minute, port 443, port 443, we didn't actually change the port over here. Doesn't this make this a NAT instead of a PAT? That's a good point. But notice the configuration was explicitly matching on a specific port. That's what continues to make this a PAT. If this was a NAT, all ports would be matched, which means if the external host had sent something to, say, port 22, the SSH port, in a NAT, this would be allowed through. Since this is a PAT, we don't have an entry for port 22, and this packet would be dropped. That's what makes this a PAT, even though the port didn't actually change. Either way, when these servers re receive those packets, they'll then respond. And just like we talked about before, a response is simply a flipping of the source and destination fields. On the way out, the source 10441, port 8080, will get mapped to 738244, port 80. And for the other packet, again, the exact same thing. What was the destination will now become the source. And you'll see the source of 104442, port 443, will get translated to 738244, port 443. So that's an example of a static PAT in action. You'll see it's very similar to a static NAT, except the only difference is we are also including ports in our definition. Now that you've seen what a static PAT looks like in action, there are four more things we want to highlight. The first has to do with one of the primary purpose of static PATs, and it's to facilitate the use of non-standard ports. Here's what I mean by that. Port 8080 is a non-standard port. If this was a web server and someone was hosting a web server on port 8080, for a user to access that site on a web browser, they would have to type in site.com followed by colon followed by the non-standard port. The issue is that most users would typically forget to put this part 
and actually take you to the wrong place. You can make this much easier for your users by creating a static PAT such that any request to port 80 will automatically get redirected to port 8080 on your web server. The cool part about port 80 is that since it's a standard web standard port, the standard default port used for web traffic, all your users really have to type into a web browser is site.com and the web browser automatically makes the request to port 80. So this non-standard port that we have a requirement to use for whatever reason was facilitated by using a static PAT. This can also work in the other direction. Let's say I was using a standard port on the inside, but I wanted it accessed from a non-standard port on the outside. I easily could have done that by rewriting my static PAT to include the non-standard port on the outside and then a standard port on the inside. In either case, anytime you're using non-standard ports, a static PAT can help facilitate to make that easier for you and your users. The next thing we want to discuss in the static PAT is what's called port forwarding. So to compare this, this is what a static NAT would look like. Notice we're only changing an IP address to an IP address versus a IP address and port to an IP address and port. In a static NAT, no matter what port traffic is sent to, it'll get mapped to the internal IP address on the same port, which means all ports are allowed through our static NAT translation. Whereas with a static PAT, only the ports we designate are forwarded through our translation. That's what port forwarding means. You're saying, hey, go ahead and let this explicit port through my translation. This is also sometimes referred to as hole punching, in which, in which case we're specifying the specific ports or the specific holes which are allowed through our translation. Now, you also could have done this by configuring a static NAT and then using an access list to block the ports you didn't want. But either way, I wanted to show you the explicit difference between a static NAT and a static PAT. Like with many things networking, there's many different ways to accomplish the same goals. The next thing we want to discuss has to do with static PAT being bidirectional. If you recall, we said that a static NAT was bidirectional, which meant that the internal host could initiate the communication or the external host could initiate the communication. Well, a static PAT is the same way. It doesn't matter who it initiates the communication, traffic will flow in both directions. And finally, the last thing we want to identify with a static PAT is that as you can see here, multiple servers are using the same public IP address. So it's simply in this illustration, we have two private addresses sharing one public address, which means a static PAT can conserve IP address space, which was again with the original purpose of NAT to begin with. If you configure it such that multiple hosts are using the same IP address, you can use static PAT to conserve IP address space. We easily could have set up a third server on our inside network. Maybe this server was hosting a mail server used on port 25. We easily could have created a third static NAT entry to give us a three to one ratio of address space conserved. So static NAT did not have the ability to conserve IP address space, but a static PAT does is the key takeaway there. So that's our lesson on static PAT. The key lesson of what a static PAT is, is it's an explicit mapping between one IP address and port and another IP address and port. I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Hey YouTube, want to learn more? Check out the rest of the free network address translation videos. Then when you're ready to take it a step further, check out these courses, which teach you how to configure, verify, and troubleshoot NAT on Cisco routers and firewalls. As always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you and have a wonderful day.